go. But, right, hello everybody. Another session on the Whiskey Circus. Um, really pleased to have along Chris Tanner, um, who is a cocktail specialist. Um, well, I'll call him a specialist in May. Change, tell me that that's not the right word and I'm not sure, but um, Chris works at the vaults, uh, or the vault, I believe it is, in Soho and the Proofing Room, which are both part of Milroy's, is that right? That's yep. Correct, yeah. So what I'll do now is I'll hand over to Chris so he can give us a little introduction to himself and what he does, and then we'll go into a few questions, and I'm hoping he's going to make us some cocktails and give us a few hints. So over to you, Chris. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, so I'm Chris. Um, I've been bartending now for nearly 10 years um, and I oversee the cocktail program and bars for Milroy's so in Spitalfields and in Soho and any kind of related projects. Um, I love it. I love making drinks. Um, it's one of my, it's, yeah, it's my passion. Um, and it's actually, it was, it was amazing today sort of setting up for this, realizing how much how good my home bar is, <laughs> how, how much great my equipment is. So it's nice to be able to do this at a time when uh, we can't have access to our bars. So thank you very much for having me. Not a problem. I mean, obviously we're kind of all whiskey buffs in here. There are a few people that do make cocktails, um, but that's kind of why I wanted to try and go a little bit left field with what we've been talking about, where it's just whiskey people and, and going to the cocktail side. So, how important is whiskey for you? I mean, I know obviously you'll make cocktails out of a lot of other things, but how important is the whiskey side to you? Um, it's, it is really important. Um, certainly coming from Milroads as well, it's kind of it's quite nice um, focusing on whiskey. And also there's just so much range in whiskey, so there's so many accents to play with in the making yeah. And with, with the whiskey then, do you, do you need to be... Do you want to just mute yourself, Steve, please? Can you just mute yourself? Oh, sorry, yeah, too much. <laughs> so just say, uh, how, how, how much whiskey do you have to keep trying then? Do, do you, are you constantly trying different whiskies and different spirits as well to come up with your um, cocktails? Yeah. All or, the time. yeah. Uh, any favourites? Um, I mean... It really depends. It's all uh, it's all sort of fit for purpose. So I mean, at the moment, uh, I mean, at the moment, I've uh, been using actually um, using a lot of Craig Edicky, Aberfeldy. Um, we're working with them for Burns Night, so that's kind of that's been really fun. I quite like the mixing of Craig Edicky. Um, some great, it's a great, great product to work with. I mean, the the impression I get then is that. Obviously, you, you will, do you come up with a cocktail first and then make, match the whiskey to it? Or will you look for a whiskey and then make a cocktail? Or does it work both um, ways? It, go, it goes both ways. Normally, um, or, so ordinarily, like, the way that our work is in like, relatively like, small increments. So it could just be like a flavor pairing and then find the product that matches that or that's going to accentuate that. There's more about there's more kind of focusing on the final product rather than what's going into it. So you kind of have so there is kind of reverse engineering. Yeah, uh, I mean Fiona's got a question. Do you wanna? Uh, I'll ask for Fiona because she's normally a bit shy sometimes. What was the pre-lockdown cocktail you. trend? The pre-lockdown cocktail, cocktail trend. Oh, pre. Well, I mean, I so red. So what's been amazing is seeing um, ready to drink cocktails. Um, or like just or like pre-made drinks so becoming premiumized and going into bars. So on um, at the Milroy's whiskey bars, we had the boutique hand drinks for the Yuzi and the pineapple, which I was a huge fan of. Um, and then also in the cocktail bars, I kind of like, I quite like using ready to drink bottles and cans anyway, because sometimes you're going to have, you're going to get some, somebody can make something that you're not going to be able to make. And there's something a little bit, I think it subverts the, uh, the the kind of traditional ideas around cocktails. So I've I've currently got um, some cucumber sake cans sitting in the proofing room, um, which are absolutely amazing. And then seeing that 
when lockdown happened, seeing bars pivot, so we did it ourselves, to start making their own ready to drink cocktails. So we're now, we did, we released a range of, of carbonated bottled drinks before Christmas, which is amazing and they sold out. So it's a nice way to see that trend continue through and then also directly impact the bars when they can't really reach their guests. Mm. And so when you're looking at making cocktails be new or interpreting old style type cocktails, how long does it actually take you to come up with these things? I mean, I know it's going to be different for each one, but, you know, is it something that comes quite quickly or? Uh, it can be. Sometimes, sometimes you nail it right away. Sometimes, yeah. sometimes you have an idea, uh, you work it out and you've got it in the afternoon. Some, some, some ideas I've sat on for um, like up to years until the right thing happened, the right situation, and then started working on it. Yeah. And so when, it, when it's taking you that long, then, is that something where you've got a flavour profile in your head and it, it's taken so, that long to find it, or is it just finding the right ingredients and mixes? Well, it's, yeah, it's, just, it's kind of a combination of everything. Like in particular, um, I wanted to, I finally put it on the menu at the cruising room at the end of last year. But I wanted to do a fino cherry and watermelon pairing, <laughs> um, and it was just kind of like, how do you, how can you kind of, and in my mind, it was really elegant rather than being like fruity. It was just kind of saline and aromatic, and like that. So that's kind of what I was aiming for, and the opportunity they could just never came together until one day I was playing around and it just worked. Mm. And with with the ingredients that you use then what what's the strangest ingredients you've maybe used oh god um i mean i understand you may have used soil in one of them and things like that yeah actually that's yeah that's correct yeah i just stilled some soil yeah um so we uh we <laughs> yeah we grabbed we so we had some, so we we had some soil um we grabbed some soil we dried it we were careful about it we made sure that it wasn't top soil and that there wasn't any fungus in it, and it was pesticide free. So it's, it's clean soil for one of a better word. Um, and then we put that in the rotor in a rotor vat. Um, so if anyone's familiar with, with how a rotor vat works, basically it distills um, and in a vacuum. So you can you can evaporate. So the boiling points are much much lower, so you can get really really amazing aromatics. Um, it's great for fresh ingredients and keeping those fresh flavors because you're, you're not you're not cooking any of the ingredients. Um, so we put the soil in the roast of that, um, and essentially made a soil a, a soil vodka, um, which is amazing. It's for everyone. It kind of um, it sounds really wanky, but it was almost kind of it was quite Proustian. For everybody, it kind of they remembered kind of being at school, playing football, right, being kids again, or running through the woods. It was really it, it smelled like it tasted like all the best bits of wet leaves and grass. I mean, the, the, the first question that comes to mind is why, but obviously you, you've kind of just maybe answered that in to, to bring back memories of, of days gone by then. Yeah, I mean, it was just, it's something, it's, it's not, it's not um, a new product. Uh, um, the, I think the first people to do it were the, uh, it was a fellow can roaster. Um, they had a distilled soil uh, ice cream, um, which I think, and that was about, I think about eight years ago. And that sort of, you try to find culinary trends then kind of drift over towards bar. Um, so I saw it, it I, I, I heard of people doing it and I just really wanted to try it out myself. Mm. Um, it's great, we, said, we paired it with, a, with yeah. powdered oats. Um, so really amazing apple flavors. And one of my favorite products, which is Mastiha, which is a Greek, which is a Greek kind of pine resin. Yeah, I think Christoph's got a question. So if you want to go and make a coffee, then by the time you get back, you'll about asked it then. So I'll hand over to you, Christoph. <laughs> Seeing as it's your birthday, we'll, we'll let you ask a question. Right, and that was Christoph's question. So, uh, sorry, go on, mate. And, and I don't, in fact, uh, I don't uh, I don't know why you said that, but uh, for once, uh, I don't. Um, um, Sorry, did you not ask I'm not about a infusing vodka? Drinker, so I don't have questions for now. So. Did you not ask about infusing vodka? It was me. Oh, yeah. sorry. Sorry, Chris. We just wanted to get you on camera, mate. <laughs> just to wish you a happy birthday, but sorry, Fiona, go on then. Thanks. 
do you infuse things like gin and vodka? Um, we do some infusions, um, but I generally, when I'm looking for a product or flavor profile, I'll try and avoid infusing just because I think like you could probably achieve the same, you could get the same result through, through curation um, or through probably something or becoming a little bit, because I think uh, like sometimes infusing feels like a bit of a hammer blow, like you're just kind of, like you're just creating like, a, like the broadest version of something. So I think there's, there's ways to achieve kind of like more elegant um, results. But yes, we, we do do some infusion. Thank you. Because bacon is amazing for Bloody Mary. Bacon vodka. Yeah, yeah, that's right. The, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, with the fat wash. Um, what we, we, I did, um, I found um, uh, one, one of the really successful fat wash that I did was a, a kind of um, an olive oil producer in Spain who runs figs through his stone press. Um, so we did a fat wash with this fig olive oil into vodka, which made a dry martini with it, and it was amazing, super mineral. I would, I would highly recommend it, olive oil. It's exactly the same process as the bacon fat, but olive oil. Amazing for a dirty martini. Yeah, exactly. I mean, one, one of the things that you sort of mentioned there was obviously the sachets and that that we can get cocktails in now. I mean, this is obviously something that's coming up, especially now we're in the COVID times. Um, how, how are you, you know, how, how did that come about and are you finding it a, a, a success with doing that or is it still a struggling sort of thing, to, but you're having to do it just to get by? Um, it's it's a bit of both. Um, we kind of have to do it. Our hand has been forced by by the environment, but it's something that we wanted to do anyway. So we were already we already had bottled drinks. So we did a we did a partnership with um, Aberfeldy at the end of 2019, where we released a bottled Aberfeldy drink. So we kind of already had the equipment. Um, Simo, if anyone knows Simo, I'm sure many of you do. Um, Simo and I have always talked about making our own sodas for highballs. Um, so we, it kind of naturally came together, and it was and it, what we did towards the end of the year last year was really successful. So I'm working now on a new on another menu release to come out in February. Yeah. I mean, have you got any other product there with you, or you know, to show us what uh, you've set well, up? Well, I mean, <laughs> you might, might as well give 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 the company a bit of a, a push, but um, I mean, well, I mean, I think. It's, I haven't, none of these are labeled up, um, but uh, <laughs> this, is, <laughs> yeah. this is a watermelon and licorice root uh, whiskey highball, yeah. which, which I'm making the label for. Um, and then I kind of just bring them home and then drink them in front of them. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, the only reason I ask is because um, a, a friend of mine that was in the whiskey industry has, has gone over to the cocktail thing at the moment. And they're producing something like that. I don't know if you've seen them. Oh, yeah, I've seen that. That's absolutely yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, th this one is a, is a Manhattan um, where 200 mil sent to your door sort of thing. And is that obviously something similar to what you guys are doing then? That's exactly what we've been doing. So we, um, before Christmas, we, um, this is actually sugar syrup at the moment, but um, we were releasing these, the so 375 mil um, demi-champagne bottles. Um, we were doing carbonated drinks, so all yeah. kind of spritzes um, and fizzes, which I think was, and it was kind of, it was, I, the idea was kind of have something larger, a larger format, more of a share of something, just get a, a few of them and have them. Yeah. And it was, was that then a, a kind of pickup thing or was that mail, mail order or? Uh, that was through delivery yeah. actually, yeah. So um, if, if anyone's interested, uh, come February, uh, the proofing.co.uk. Uh, or get in touch with Millwood. Uh, do you want to just, really just repeat that, Chris? Do you want to just repeat that? Because you did actually freeze, so we want to make sure we get all the info out there. Sorry, yeah. So it's theproofingroom.co.uk, um, and there's a section there where we'll deliver all our bottled cocktails. And if you get in touch with Millroy's, uh, they can all arrange delivery for you as well. Yeah. Is that something that you will probably try and look at to carry on once we hopefully come out of COVID times, you know, are you going to keep that as, as a side business then? Or... Yeah, absolutely. I think, I, I think it's brilliant. It, it's so much fun. It, it kind of, it, it changes how you work, you know, kind of making these huge batches. Um, 
if anything, you can you have a little bit more leeway because you don't have to think too much about the guest experience. You're kind of yeah. creating it. So it's, it's, it's a new way of working, which I really enjoy. Yeah, brilliant. Um, I think Ed's got a question. Do you want to bring that in now, Ed? Yeah. Um, Chris, my uh, my local is uh, public up in Sheffield, and they've got a um, sort of a not zero waste, but sort of a um, trying to reduce waste in sort of the things that they produce and do things like using sort of um, flat sort of coke and sodas and um, things like bananas that are nearly gone rotten and things like that. Have you guys, um, what sort of stuff do you guys do in, in terms of reusing things and getting a little bit creative to try and reduce the waste that you have on bar? So we, um, we make uh, a uh, jasmine cordial from all of our fruit, so all of the food waste, all the fruit waste. Um, we uh, macerate it um, with just a little bit of sugar to draw out the oils. Um, make and then add wine tannin, malic acid, and citric acid to that, um, and then put it into uh, jasmine seeds. So you end up kind of it ends up becoming almost a like cranberry juice. It's, it, we call it ocean spray cordial because it, because it's you know how ocean spray dries out your tongue because of all the tannin from the tea and from the added wine tannins, so you end, and then the fruitiness you get this kind of grenadine cranberry tannin, and we can use that to make non-alcoholic spritzes or to make alcoholic spritzes as well. That sounds really cool. <laughs> That's great, yeah. And there's actually a company that I want to work with moving forward when we'll, with our upcoming project. Um, I found a company based in Italy that makes paper from uh, lemon uh, rinds. Oh, wow. Awesome. Yeah, so be, I, I like cool. the idea of having all our menus printed on, uh, on, on the menus being from the waste. Mm. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I love that idea. That's fun. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> Yeah, that, that sounds really good. I mean, that, it, it is something obviously that is coming up a lot is is making sure that you know the waste is minimal and things like that. What was was that a thought when you decided to put the cocktails out in glass bottles then, or you know, it was, was that just actually, the easiest yeah, was, for you? It was. I mean, I, I like the bottles, but it was it was definitely a conversation that we had. Um, I think I, uh, I think there's a lot of people out there at the moment that are making ready to drink cocktails and they're using single use plastic. I think it's pretty irresponsible considering mm. the carbon footprint that as an industry we have already. Um, it, I don't think it's a good look for us. Yeah, uh, I think uh, Vim had a question. Um, I think it was from Wim. Do you want to ask that Vim or hopefully it was from you? Is it there? Yeah, he's saying he can't do the talking at the moment. All so. ah, right, right. So, sorry. Uh, so the, the question from Vim was, um, estimated from your bar experience, would you say whiskey is bigger than cocktails or the other way around? <laughs> uh, I, I knew at some point today there was going to be a wit like neat versus mix conversation. <laughs> um, it's different. Um, I think, I mean, to be fair, the cocktail industry is booming. It doesn't seem to slow down. Um, from the bar experience, um, I mean, I've worked, I've, I've worked, in, I've worked in rum bars. I worked, I've managed whiskey bars. Um, I think it depends on the guest. It's, it's, it's two different products. You know, if somebody wants a whiskey, they're going for a whiskey. You're not going to talk them into having mm. a cocktail. And similarly, if somebody wants a cocktail, you're not about to talk them into having a, a, a glass of wine. You see, yeah, I mean. I I would have kind of thought it might work slightly different to that. I mean, in my impression, a lot of people that are drinking cocktails, you might be able to talk them into breaking it down to go to whiskey rather than, you know. But the interesting thing is, and I know this is sort of one of those things, both my daughters and that, they, they love to go out and, you know, they're always buying a cocktail. And the first thing that comes into my head is how bloody much. Um, but, you know, <laughs> I, I suppose that obviously represents the ingredients and the time and the effort that you're putting in to, to actually make them. I mean, yeah, it, exactly. It, it does. The cost, of, um, the cost of running a cocktail team, the prep, when I, the, you see the, the numbers versus the whiskey bar versus the cocktail bar and the GP and GP for it, it's just, like the cost of a cocktail bar uh, is, is a bit ridiculous because mm. you've got... It's just, it's all, it's all the ingredients, it's the prep, it's the team, it's the training.
maintaining like the long term cost of having people in. Yeah, um, it's it's considerable. But I I think it, it's I think there is a tendency though. Like even I sometimes I go to bars and I'm like, how much? Like you, like I know what's in here. Like mm-hmm. this doesn't cost that much. Yeah, um, there is a, so there is a tendency I think for uh, for some bars to price gouge. Yeah, I mean, Paul Winston's come up with a question, um, so I'll let him ask it, because I was going to ask a very similar question, but might as well let Paul fire it away, yeah. which I think is connected to that bit, so hopefully Paul can ask his. Yeah, sure, sorry. Yeah, just from a sort of mixologist point of view, um, what are your views on the, the, the trend now of sort of whiskies being made for mixing or for cocktails? Is that something you, you take notice of, or is it more of a gimmick? It is, yeah. I think that's great. I think that's great. The more the more people that we can get to enjoy any aspect of this industry, be it the whiskey or any other spirit, or even if it's just like a fruity cocktail, the more we can share our our bars and our products with people who ordinarily wouldn't go there. I think that's brilliant. So I think the people want to make if producers want to make a whiskey that's made to be mixed with soda, let's go for it. It's, it's a great idea. Mm. I mean that's interesting, and Paul probably is thinking the same thing. You see. From a whiskey point of view, I think it's quite a gimmick um, because to me, and I know this is, you know, this this is the side of me that probably doesn't help the cocktail side. But to me, a cocktail, you know, if, if you've got a, a decent whiskey on the bar, it should be able to be used for a cocktail. Now, hopefully you're going to prove me wrong. But, you know, when, when you see these companies saying, oh, no, this, this one's made specifically for a cocktail, what what's the difference? Well, I think I think it, it the ones that I'm kind of thinking about uh, are kind of more leaning towards kind of whiskey soda or highball whiskey. Like, mm. That's what I'm I'm, I'm of certain brands that put those out. Um, I think it is it is perhaps a little gimmicky, or it it could be it could come across as being disingenuous. But not all whiskies are going to be delicious topped up with soda. Mm. Um, and if there's, and if, and if uh, I understand why brands do it, if they can get people to have like their drink that's going to be a toky and soda, like yeah. you know, go like yeah. fine, you know, that's that's um, whether I like the whiskey or not is is different. It's, it's not. It's that for the guests. To decide. Mm. I mean, obviously, I know Dave's in the room today, and I'm sure he'll be holding a bottle up in a minute when we bring him in because his company has got a pretty good one that is kind of made for that. And Andy's um, brought up this exact same thing I was going to say. So, I mean, Ockentoshin have brought one out called the Bartender's Malt, which is supposedly made for, you know, bartenders and cocktails. You just think it's it's a whiskey that's been brought out at a more expensive price range than what it should be because it's made as apparently for bartenders by bartenders. Yeah. I mean, yeah, exactly. That's a bit, uh, that's a bit cheesy, isn't it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I think, I think there's ten. So there is, um, so there is. I, can, I there are products that I know that are made sort of for bartenders, um, and they rightly kind of have the higher price point, usually because bartenders want um, higher ABV, mm-hmm. or they, or they, or they're looking for a particular flavor profile. I know some, there's um, a Geneva that's made. Um, that's absolutely amazing uh but that's made for bartenders and it's um it's like it it takes them it's, it's the way that it's produced it takes so much work to get it up to an abv because it should it's Geneva traditionally should be about 30 percent mm. and them to just fill it up to i think it takes up to about 52 is amazing and it draws out all those flavors and so but rightly that carries a higher price point but then if you're just going to release like a bartender whiskey without paying any extra duty on it or whatever putting a price up yeah i mean the last the last sort of thing i want to talk about in this first section is ice um i mean (laughs) one one of the things that i've seen spoken about a lot is is the size of ice the shape of ice that you're going to use in a cocktail how important is this and and you know can you explain to us why and you know the shapes and things what what difference it makes Right, so um, ice. Uh, firstly, you taste with your eyes, but just from an aesthetic point of view, having like a big block of ice in your drink looks great. Um, secondly, though, um, if the, the clear ice and the way that the clear ice is produced, it has less impurities. Whether you taste it or not is, is 
is different. Um, I, I don't know that you can. What it does have though is it's, um, because of the, any gases that are trapped in, in the liquid um, are forced out, it is denser. So it has it so it melts slower. Um, it also has a lower surface area than lots of little ice cubes in your glass. So it doesn't dilute your drink as, as quickly. So essentially, so it, so it does. So there is a practical, like practical, um, a practical there is there is a practical use for it. But I think predominantly it's aesthetic, and it looks great. I mean, it, it looks phenomenal. You know, like having a block of ice. And um, what's the difference then, say, from having a nice big block of a square block rather than a sphere, or you know, something that's Round and... So the versus the sphere is um, obviously uh, from a practical point of view, um, the sphere is going to have uh, a smaller surface area. Um, so that, there's definitely that. But then I think you know if, if you see some Japanese bartenders and they're just they're carving diamonds and all these amazing things, I think that's more of a show of skill for aesthetic purposes than anything else. Yeah. Um, Fiona's got one question. Then I'll let her ask this, and then we'll we'll go into the second part. So go on then, Fiona. So I'm just trying to work out. Ah, I've asked a couple of questions. Yes. Firstly, which Geneva, please? Oh, which it Geneva? is. Um, I can tell you right away. Uh, are you a Geneva fan? Yes, I drink everything. <laughs> is I I can't remember his name. It's names. It's it's a, it's a man's name. They're the producers of Bobby's Gin um, oh, and Bobby's Geneva, uh, based out in Skidam, and they produce Geneva in the old style. So um, small stills and distilling it up to ABV, like gradually, gradually like increasing the in small increments. Um, but I can't, it's Peter. We, we can come back to it if you want, Chris. Yeah, we can come yeah, back it's to gonna, it. It's gonna, it's gonna pop, it, pop up in a minute. Yeah. Thank you. I've got the Bobby's Gym, which is great. But can I just ask what layer you use, please? What do you um, use for layering? When you layer cocktail? Me. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah. When you layer like the squash frog or the black velvet, what do you use? What to layer a cocktail? Yeah. I know you can uh, use well, food, but there are lots of different things out there, and I'm always after gadgets. Oh, so, so literally, so the way to layer drinks is it's just about um, the density of the liquid. So if you pour very slowly down the side of the glass, you can just layer it like that. Um, if you're interested in, in like sort of layering drinks, um, there is an entire there's a whole book dedicated to fruit cafes, which uh, traditionally like layered layered shots, um, some with egg yolks in them uh, that were really popular um, in the cafe culture of Europe at the turn of the 1900s. And they've got um, recipes that you can check out and see. Thank you. I've got three different layering tools, but I'm always after new ones. Yeah, so I think the best way to do it is just to practice with uh, varying liquids of different densities. 